I remember the difference between Memorial Day and the other holidays. Armed Forces Day is for the service members in uniform. Veterans Day is for those who have hung up their uniform. And Memorial Day is for those who never made it out of their uniform. John F. Kennedy said, a nation reveals itself not only by the people it produces, but the people it honors and the people that it remembers. No matter the era, our veterans from World War II, Korea, the Cold War, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, and other far-flung places across the globe, we have always answered the call. Whether in war or peace, our veterans have always done what our country has required, and perhaps a bit more. We are happy to have so many of you in attendance today. Would everyone that can please stand as the Rear Admiral O'Kane Division of Sea Cadets posts the colors. Join us in the Pledge of Allegiance led by former Mare Island Base Commander and Chief Warrant Officer for USN Retired Ron Gibson. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible. Chaplain Wallace Waitley, Commander of the United States Navy here. Well, since he does not appear he is, I'm going to dispense with the invocation and ask the color guard to retire the colors. Oh. And veteran hand salute. Thank you. You may be seated. So first, I would like to present uh, Leo Mayor Bob O'Connell to give his remarks. Mayor O'Connell. Thank you, Mayor. And good morning to each and every one of you here. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. May I, may I express the appreciation of the city of Vallejo and, of course, the people of Vallejo. For those of you who made the effort to come here today to honor our veterans, our people who are in service, but especially those who have fallen. Uh, many of us had many friends, acquaintances, family members who on this day we remember. It's thus a bittersweet day for many of us. 
so to your own thoughts, please give reference to those people who did pay that supreme price. That is indeed what Memorial Day is all about. And in many ways, unfortunately, here in America, here in Vallejo, we are again faced with war on our streets. We have people killing each other in this city. And for those of you who served, you know that you did not pick up that weapon unless you meant to use it. For those of us in the city where we have these problems, it is time for them to put down that weapon because they serve no good other than their own self agenda. For those of us who did serve, it is time for us to rally and to call out those people who make a mockery of the values upon which we placed our lives and in many cases lost them. This is an intolerable situation in our city, in our country. It's a mockery of the Second Amendment. And as veterans, it is really our responsibility to stand up and to do something to stop this carnage on our streets. Because we do not wish to have memorial services for family members who were trapped in crossfire or inadvertently hit by ricocheting bullets. So it is time that we pay attention to what is going on in our own streets as well. And as mayor, I ask you to respect what the people of Vallejo, and more especially the veterans, have accomplished to prevent this type of mockery of our values. It is, in, it is incorrect, it is wrong, and it needs to stop. But on a lighter note, I want you to say thank you to my city council members who are here, because you show your dedication to our city and to the 8,000 veterans in this city who honor us with their presence here today. So to each of you, again, thank you. It is my privilege to uh, read this proclamation, recognizing our fallen heroes on Memorial Day. Whereas since our great nation's birth, our beloved America has been blessed with an infinite chain of dedicated service members who have served with patriotism, honor, and distinction. Patriotism, honor, and distinction we need to have throughout the city. And from the bombs bursting in air over New England to the halls of Montezuma, seas of the Philippines, skies of Europe, frozen tundras of Korea, rice paddies of Vietnam, and the mountains and deserts of Iraq and Afghanistan, generations of brave warriors have valiantly fought our country's battles in the land, the air, and sea. And whereas on Memorial Day we pay tribute to our fallen heroes who have fought and died for our beloved country, whose gratitude they will always have, and we remember them today for what they fought for and who they were. Proud and dedicated men and women, often far too young, who were guided by a deep and abiding comradeship for fellow service members, love for their families and friends, and selfish service for our great nation. Whereas, let us always remember and respect our fallen warriors by living up to the ideals they died defending. And it is our charge to preserve liberty, to advance justice, and to show the seeds of peace with honor, courage, and devotion worthy of our fallen heroes' legacy. So let us rededicate ourselves to these noble objectives by staying the course and sustaining our gains to prove that our city and our nation's best days are still ahead. And whereas on Monday, May 31st, two local ceremonies are being held. The first was at nine o'clock, conducted by the city of Vallejo for the 150th commemoration since 1871. At the Mare Island and Naval Cemetery, and the second today, now, conducted by the U.S. Submarine Veterans Mare Island Base at the Vallejo Veterans Memorial Park behind City Hall. And now, therefore, be proclaimed that I, Robert McConnell, Mayor of Vallejo, the City of Vallejo, and the City Council, and each of its members, do hereby declare Memorial Day, May 31st, 2021, as honoring our fallen heroes day. A day to remember and pray for the souls of those who died in war as they rest in eternal peace. We urge the citizens of Vallejo to attend our annual Memorial Day ceremonies 
and we'll always keep our fallen heroes and their comrades and friends close in our hearts. And we ask for everyone to participate in a national moment of remembrance at 3 o'clock this afternoon, our local time. It is only befitting that we respect those who have fallen, but to those of us who did not, we are charged with what they fought for. And if we fail them, we are not living up to our ideals. It is time for us to address the carnage in our streets, because otherwise we will have more victims, we will have more memorial services. And as Mayor Davis charged us in the past, as we are coming out of COVID, and I see Mayor Davis here. Thank you, Mayor Davis, for being here. Next time, next year, bring not one or two or three people, but four or five with you so that this crowd will grow. Next year, we will not have the restrictions of COVID, and it will be time to honor, once again, you know, the ideals that we fought for because it is time. So thank you very much, and thank you especially for being here. You know, masks bring back mad, bad memories for me, I just wanted to say, because I wore one for 14 days under the ice one time. Thank you, Mayor McConnell. I would also like to acknowledge the entire City Council's attendance here today, Vice Mayor Rosanna Verda Oliga. <clears throat> Christina Ariola. Hakeem Brown, Stephen Du, Nina Diaz, and Katie Messner. Along with City Manager Greg Nyhoff and City Attorney Veronica Neff. It is really wonderful to have all of you in attendance. I also want to welcome I've been looking for them. Supervisors Ennergan Hannigan and Monica Brown of the Solano County Board of Supervisors. Oh, I'm just covering all the bases. So. And also um, all the Vallejo School Board trustees, Tony Abaldi, Latanya Young, Tony Gross, Christine Gardner, John Fox, and Vallejo School Superintendent John Spaulding. Form Former Mayors Tony and Tiddley, Osby Davis, and Bob Sapayan. And I would like to ask, we're going to go into proclamations, and I would like to ask uh, Congressman Mike Thompson, who's represented by Edgar Rosales, if he would come forward, please. Solace. I'm the Wounded Warrior Fellow for Congressman Mike Thompson's office. Uh, the Congressman wasn't, wasn't able to be here today, but he asked me to read a letter on his behalf. Dear friends, I am sorry I cannot be with you today, but work has me in another part of our district. Memorial Day began in the wake of the Civil War to honor fallen Union soldiers. The tribute grew after World War I into a chance to honor all of those who died in the American wars. It's become a solemn moment to grieve with those who've lost loved ones in the line of duty. Today we honor service and sacrifice of our nation's service members, and we must remember that our freedom is not free. Each year, I am reminded of the words of President Franklin D. Roosevelt, who said, those who have long enjoyed such privileges as we enjoy, forget in time that men have died to win them. As we recognize their, their heroism, we must remember our responsibility. Because our men and women in uniform served us, we must in turn serve them. We must work to make certain our veterans have every opportunity to put a roof over their heads, secure a job, and have health care. 
know that I've sponsored legislation to address these important issues and that I'll continue working to serve our veterans and their families, not just today on Memorial Day, but every day. Thank you and God bless America. Sincerely, Congressman Mike Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar. Is Tom Barti here representing Senator Bill Dodd? Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you all for being here today. And uh, I just want to reiterate what was said earlier, uh, quoting former Mayor Davis, to bring 10 people next year and we'll double the size of this crowd. I'm here today on behalf of Senator Dodd who was unable to make it and uh, regrets that he's elsewhere in the district. But I have a, a few brief comments from on his behalf. <clears throat> I want to share a few words with you on this special day. Memorial Day, which is observed on the last Monday of May, is our time to commemorate the ultimate devotion to duty of the more than 656,000 men and women who died in battle, as well as the over 552,000 who died in service, but not in battle. I thank everyone here today on, on this 150th Memorial Day, as we remember all of our fallen heroes and to honor all the past and present military members who selflessly risk their lives every day so we can enjoy our freedom and our American way of life. We must continue to honor our living veterans by doing our part in protecting the freedoms that we have taken for granted. And more importantly, let us willingly share our time, talents, and treasures to also improve the lives of our veterans, our troops in uniform, their families, as well as all Americans. May God bless each and every one of you and your families. And may God continue to bless the United States of America. Sincerely, Senator Bill Dodd. Thank you. <clears throat> Calvet Secretary Vito Masciani is represented today by Julian Caracas. Hopefully I didn't put your name too badly. And she has something she would like to read to us from the governor. Good morning, I'm Julian Carricas of the California Department of Veterans Affairs, and Dr. Mbassiani expresses his deep uh, regret that he couldn't be here today. Uh, at CalVet, we work to honor and serve our veterans every single day and their families. I'm also a U.S. veteran, and I'd like to share today with you a name. Senior Airman Jason Nathan of the 48th Security Forces Squadron 48th RAF Lake Athene, who gave the ultimate sacrifice in June 2007 at Tikrit, Iraq, Camp Spiker. May I remember him and all those who came before him and all those who will. I'm honored today and privileged to read the governor's proclamation declaring today Memorial Day. On Memorial Day, we pay tribute to those fallen heroes who gave their lives while defending our constitution and our freedom. In enduring respect and gratitude for their sacrifice, we hold in our hearts those who fought to preserve our way of life, never to see their loved ones again. Every year, Californians uphold the solemn tradition that began as Decoration Day in 1868, in memory of those lost during the Civil War. In 1971, Congress established Memorial Day as a national day of remembrance of all Americans who have perished in our nation's wars. Today, we honor them. We hold dear those interred in our state cemeteries, nine national cemeteries, and all of the local cemeteries throughout California, as well as those who have come home in spirit, if not body. They are forever etched into the hearts and minds of their loved ones and fellow citizens of a grateful nation, with some of their names gracing monuments in Washington, D.C., state capitals, and our town squares. In memory of the fallen, I have ordered that flags be flown at half staff on all state buildings and grounds throughout California. In addition, I ask you to join me by participating in the national uh, moment of remembrance at 3 p.m. local time on Memorial Day. 
a shared moment of silence to honor those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. Now therefore, I, Gavin Newsom, Governor of the State of California, do hereby proclaim May 31st, 2021 as Memorial Day. Thank you. Finally, Command Sergeant Major Patrick McKee of the 63rd Readiance Division. Are you here so we can acknowledge you? Definitely not. Well, now I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. James Holm Armstead, Jr. Dr. J. Holmes Armstead is a retired professor of strategy and international law from the U.S. Naval War College. He has taught international law, strategy, and national security policy for nearly 50 years. Professor Armstead has served on faculties at Stanford University, Pepperdine University, the University of California, University of Nevada, Southern University, the U.S. Naval Postgraduate School, Lewis University, the Virginia Military Institute, and Washington and Lee University. He's also lectured as the British Joint Services Staff College and taught as a visiting professor at the University de Pau in France as an exchange professor in Richmond College at the University of London. He has lectured at senior staff colleges in Poland, Australia, Germany, Slovenia, Estonia, and Malawi, as well as the U.S. Army War College and at military academies in the United States. Poland, Ukraine, and South Africa. Jim has also served as a research associate at the RAND Corporation, which has sponsored his dissertation, Lightweight Power Project, and been chief of staff to a member of Congress. Working for the Department of Defense, he served on negotiation teams enlarging NATO with the accession of Poland, Hungary, Montenegro, Slovenia, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic, Albania, Latvia, Lithuania. Jim has also assisted in drafting constitutional reforms in Montenegro, South Africa, Poland, the Congo, and Estonia, and has served as a counsel to the American Bar Association Office of Human Rights, and served as legal advisor to the U.S.-Canadian Acid Rain Treaty Negotiation. Professor Armstead resides in the Sierra Nevada mountains of Northern California and continues to write and lecture. Welcome, Professor. Professor Armstead. By the way, my mother believes every word of that. <laughs> my mother-in-law tries to figure out who they're talking about whenever I'm introduced. She's not too sure. Mayor McConnell, distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, submariners, sailors, airmen, Coast Guardsmen, and my fellow soldiers. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you today, this wonderful, beautiful Memorial Day. What a peaceful and wonderful setting. The water nearby, the sun shining. It's a fantastic day. It's my pleasure, it's my great pleasure to be here with you. And it's also an esteemed honor to be asked to give a few appropriate remarks. Uh, Historically, I suppose I'm in good company. You see, after the organizing committee at Gettysburg decided to make a national cemetery there and invited their keynote speaker, someone thought that as an oversight, they'd forgotten the president. So Mr. Lincoln was asked to also give a few appropriate remarks. Now, the keynote speaker that day, the 19th of November, 1863, was a Professor Edward Everett. Professor Everett, I, which I assume most of you will not know, uh, spoke for two and one half hours. I have not taken him as my guide today. I want you to know that. <laughs> Professor Everett was considered by his good friend Daniel Webster to be the best orator in the United States. Uh, he was a politician. No, no offense, Mr. He was a politician. He was the 15th governor of Massachusetts. He had also served as a congressman from Massachusetts several terms. He had been a senator from Massachusetts. He had been our minister plenipotentiary to the United Kingdom. He had been secretary of state. 
As a young man, he served as a Presbyterian minister. He was one of the first Americans to receive his PhD overseas. Uh, he wrote and studied Greek literature at Göttingen University uh, in the 1820s in Germany. And he was a professor at Harvard. Now, to top all that off, that wasn't the high point of his career, I might add. He was at the time serving as the president of Harvard University. He spoke, as I said, for two and a half, two and one half hours. Mr. Lincoln, by the way, spoke for two and one half minutes, 242 words in his lecture that day. And every schoolboy in America and girl uh, knows the Gettysburg Address by heart. No one knows who Edward Everett was. Dr. Everett covered the, of course, his favorite subject, uh, Greek uh, tragedy, Greek literature. He talked about Athens and what the memorial services were like in ancient Athens, what the Greeks had done to memorialize their honored dead. He then gave a rendition of the strategic history of the Civil War to that point, what had gone on, what was on the minds of the, uh, of the rebel enemy, uh, how successful they had been up until Gettysburg and why Memorial Day was important, I'm sorry, why the dedication of the cemetery was important. As I said, two and a half hours, I won't, uh, uh, you know, we can, I have a speech here, by the way, just in case someone is interested, but we won't, uh, we won't do that. Well, what is this thing, Memorial Day? You've heard uh, the mayor's very eloquent uh, comments, you've heard the governor's proclamation, you've heard the proclamation of the city of Vallejo, uh, and, uh, and of course our, uh, our esteemed master of ceremonies talks about the importance of Memorial Day, why we remember our honored dead. We mourn their passing, but we honor their sacrifice. We grieve for losing them, but we praise their service. We have picked this day out of many other days that we have for other causes. As was mentioned earlier, we have a day for veterans, we have days for service members, service day, but this is a special day for those who made the supreme sacrifice for our country. The history of the day actually is rather short, but I, hopefully I can tell you some new things about it. Uh, headquarters, Grand Army of the Republic, Washington DC, 5 May, 1868, General Order 11. The 30th day of May is designated for the purpose of strewning with flowers or otherwise directing and decorating the graves of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lay in almost every city, village, and hamlet churchyard in the land. In observing this day, no particular ceremony or form is prescribed, but at post and with comrades, in their own way, arranging such fitting services and testimony as reflects the circumstances may permit. By command of John A. Logan, Major General, Commander-in-Chief. General Logan created Decoration Day as a recognized remembrance for our memorialized fallen. He did this in 1868, but around the country, people had begun to decorate graves all, at all times during the year. And in particular, particularly in the spring. Many cities have laid claim to being the first to have a decoration day. However, on 5 May, 1865, 9,000 newly freed slaves in Charleston, South Carolina, organized by the Freedmen's Bureau and by their churches, removed the bodies of 257 fallen Union soldiers from what had been the largest racetrack in the country, which was in Charleston, and had been turned after Andersonville had been taken, had been turned into a Confederate prisoner of war camp. Those by, and these, these men had been buried without ceremony, as you can imagine, the, uh, the latter days of the war, uh, the South was under a tremendous amount of pressure. Uh, having ceremonies for fallen enemies was not something high on their list of priorities, as you can well understand. So these bodies were removed 
and with great ceremony, uh, they were placed in a newly created cemetery, the Charleston Cemetery, Military Cemetery, outside of the race course. And the graves were decorated with flowers. Not only that, the entire field where these 257 remains were removed to, the entire field was covered in flowers by these 9,000 new American citizens who understood that their freedom was based upon the sacrifice these men had so recently made. Well, the day is important for many reasons. Sometimes the personal part of losing a veteran gives us to understand that the loss can be tremendous for a family, a community, as well as for a unit, a military unit in any of the country. During the war, and I don't know that it can be said any better than this particular letter I found you. During the war, Mr. Lincoln was shown the files of the Adjutant General of Massachusetts that referred to a mother who had lost five sons, uh, and as he remarked, who had died so gloriously on the field of battle. And he wrote this mother a letter. And I'll read you the closing part of that. It's addressed to a Mrs. Bixby. I feel how weak and fruitless must be any word of mine which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming. She had lost five sons. But I cannot refrain from tendering you the consolation that may be found in the thanks of the Republic they died to save. I pray that our Heavenly Father may assuage the anguish of your bereavement and leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and lost and the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. Yours sincerely and respectfully, A. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln understood that there were tremendous sacrifices. Two of his brothers-in-law had died during the war. A number of his own family, and of course his wife's family, which were Kentucky, were killed during the war. So he understood this personally. He had a somewhat, as many of you will know who read history, a somewhat depressive personality, and the war weighed heavily upon him as it was progressed. He persecuted the war because he understood saving the Union had to be preeminent in his goal. He did many other things, by the way. Lincoln, in my opinion, was a genius. Uh, Jefferson, the best educated of presidents. Lincoln, the one genius. Uh, he had uh, about 250 days of schooling. Uh, he read a book a week. Uh, he taught himself during the Black Hawk Wars military arts by reading uh, Jomini and Clausewitz at the time, uh, and was elected captain of the local militia a position I now hold. I can understand how important that is. We're not fighting the Blackhawks any longer, by the way. Anybody from Illinois might wonder about that. Mr. Lincoln understood just how important winning the war was, saving the Union, and he understood the sacrifice that was made. We have lost approximately 1.2 million service members in the last 250 odd years of our existence. They are honored today, and we need to understand that to truly honor them is by working to make this country hour of ours a more perfect union. We honor that sacrifice by participating as volunteers in our community, some of us by joining the military, the reserves perhaps, or active duty, but also by serving the community with charitable organizations, we honor it by understanding what the issues are that face the country. The mayor mentioned, and I believe there was a recent death last night, the shootings that are taking place, a pandemic around the country, as dangerous, as destructive to our country as the biological pandemic we've been dealing with the last 18 months or so. The gun violence that we see, we need to understand what the issues are. Our national capital was attacked and invaded within the last six months by fellow Americans, not by foreigners. 
no foreign, well, except of course uh, the British in 1814, uh, no foreign army has ever invaded our country to the extent and with the danger that we suffered from our own citizens who I believe in the most part misunderstood what they were doing. They misunderstood the issues, they did not understand the voting process, what had happened, and were unwilling to accept what they did not like. I offer to you the danger in that sort of thinking, that that is the political situation that existed in 1859, and we know where that led. 617,000 Americans on both sides perished in that conflict that could have been resolved with understanding what the issues were. Uh, as an aside, the, um, the South ran three candidates for president. They were participating. Uh, their votes were split three ways and they lost and then didn't want to participate any longer and decided to prosecute a long and difficult war. More Americans were killed in the, the Civil War than of all of our other wars combined. Mr. Lincoln, who I'd like to quote again, also talks about the position in which we should hold in reverence our honored dead on the battlefield, what it means to us, what their sacrifice should be for us. He said in his address, we are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who gave their lives, that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this, but in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead have consecrated it far better than our poor power to add or detract. He went on to say, it is for us the living rather to be dedicated to the great unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take that increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. I think Mr. Lincoln says it best. It is the responsibility of those of us who remain to make sure that those sacrifices are honored and honored by us preserving this wonderful thing we have. Mr. Franklin was asked when he left the Constitution Hall in Philadelphia, after the consideration to replace the Articles of Confederation, he was asked, what form of government have you given us, Mr. Franklin, in this Continental Congress, then a symbol? And he said, Madam, a republic, if you can keep it. Well, I think the test of keeping our republic exists every day. It exists for us to understand the issues that are before us, all the things that must be considered to keep a government, the willingness of people to volunteer, to participate in the political process, to man election polls on election day as volunteers, so that the process of election takes place without undue consternation. I have sat as an election judge in 12 countries around the world and looked at the process in a number of ways. And I can tell you, our process stacks up relatively well that there are places where people's right to vote are threatened each and every day, where people are physically threatened at the election polls, where as a foreign and OSCE election judge, I was threatened. Uh, in, in Belarus, it was certainly made clear to me that I wasn't going to be welcomed back because I found them cheating in an election. This cost the uh, state of Belarus about $16 million. They were on a fast track from the EU to receive a loan. I marvel the other day as I see that Mr. Lukashenko brought down an airplane to arrest a journalist. He knows my name, by the way. Uh, makes me a little concerned about going back. I've asked the OSC to send me to some other places next, but some of those haven't been as nice as well. So we have these responsibilities. They are important. 
And by the way, I grew up in Chicago. I know how to steal an election. I was a prosecutor there. They weren't very good at it. They could have been much better. I would like to draw your attention for a moment, if I might, once again looking at history, to who it is we celebrate today. Who are these honored dead? What were they fighting for? Every nation has lost soldiers. Every great nation, every long-standing nation, they have honored dead. Even back to the Greeks, as, uh, as Professor Everett talked about on that fall day in 1863. And you might ask, who these men were, what they died for, why they fought. And I think it can't be stated any better than General MacArthur in his well-known duty, honor, country address. He was talking to young officers in May of, 18, of 1962 at the Military Academy uh, when he received the Sylvania Thayer Award. Uh, uh, Major Thayer was an artillery officer, was the founder of West Point 1803. And every year an award is given to the graduate of the military academy who best exemplifies the motto, duty, honor, country. And MacArthur was the recipient that year of the award. He was um, at the time 80, 83 years old. He's elderly. Uh, he was infirm. He knew from his doctors that this was probably his last public speech. He spoke up for 40 minutes, by the way, without any notes. I'm not going to read you the entire speech. Who these men were. He was telling this to the young officers who were going to go out and lead. And what sort of soldiers are those you are to lead? Are they reliable? Are they brave? Are they capable of victory? Their story is known to all of you. It is the story of the American man at arms. My estimate of him was formed on battlefields many years ago and has never changed. I regarded him then, and I regard him now, as one of the world's noblest figures, not only as one of the finest military characters, but also as one of the most stainless. His name and fame are the birthright of every American citizen. In his youth and strength, his love and loyalty, he gave all that mortality can give. He needs no eulogy from me or from any other man. He has written his own history and written it in red on his enemy's breast. But when I think of this patience under adversity, of his courage under fire, of his modesty and victory, I am filled with an emotion of admiration I cannot put into words. He belongs to history as furnishing one of the greatest examples of successful patriotism. He belongs to posterity as the instructor of future generations in the principles of liberty and freedom. He belongs to the present, to us, by his virtues and by his accomplishments. In 20 campaigns on 100 battlefields around 1,000 campfires, I have witnessed that enduring fortitude, that patriotic self-abnegation, and that invincible determination which have carried his stature in the hearts of his people. From one end of the world to the other, he has drained deep the chalice of courage. As I listen to the songs, songs had been played that day, old songs at the Academy uh, for General MacArthur, who had been a superintendent from 1919 to 1923. And of course, he's a graduate of the class of 1903. He'd spent some considerable time there. As I listened to those songs in memory's eye, I could see those staggering columns of the First World War, bending under soggy packs on the many a weary march, from dripping dust to drizzling dawn, slogging ankle deep through the mire and shell pock roads to form grimly for the attack, blue-lipped, covered with sludge and mud, chilled by the wind and rain, driving home to their objective, and for many, to the judgment seat of God. I do not know the dignity of their birth, but I do know the glory of their death. They died unquestioning, uncomplaining, with faith in their hearts and on their lips, and hope that we would go on to victory. Always for them, duty, honor, country, always their blood and sweat and tears as we sought the way and the light and the truth. And 20 years after, on the other side of the globe, again, the filth of murky flocks holes, the stench of ghostly trenches, the slime of dripping dugouts, 
those broiling suns of relentless heat, those torrential rains of devastating storms, the loneliness and utter devastation of jungle trails, the bitterness of long separation from those they loved and cherished, the deadly pestilence of tropical disease, the horrors of stricken areas of war, their resolute and determined defense, their swift and sure attack, their indomitable purpose, their complete and decisive victory, always victory, always through the bloody haze of their last reverberating shot, the vision of gaunt, ghostly men, reverently following your password, duty, honor, country. The code which those words perpetuate embraces the highest moral law and will stand the test of any ethics or philosophies ever promoted for the uplift of mankind. Its requirements are for things that are right, and its restraints are from those things that are wrong. These are the men, and yes, women, that we have sent out to fight our wars the last 250 years. They are the ones who lie in graveyards around this great land of ours and around the world. The Battle Monuments Commission has cemeteries all over the world where we fought. We're in 16 countries at, at present, and I think there are plans for even, even more cemeteries and other, other places. These are the people we've sent out. These are the people we honor today. And they have not gone out as conquerors. We don't conquer foreign lands. We don't take things from other people. We fight to defend our rights. We fight to defend our freedoms, to defend this country of ours. I'd like to close, I'm sure you're glad to hear that, with a prayer. We did not have an invocation earlier today, and I happen to have this with me. I was going to reference it, but, uh, but I have the prayer. Uh, on June 6, 1944, Franklin Roosevelt had a radio interview. The day before Rome had fallen, and the president made an announcement about the Italian campaign, which was now about half over. The 5th United States Army on the east, the British 8th Army on the west, were advancing north that day, in fact, out of Rome. There was an invasion being prepared for southern France. Uh, General Deaver's 6th Army was about to invade. And Roosevelt, of course, knew all this. But the great secret of the Second World War from the American point of view was, of course, D-Day, which was going to be the next day after he had made those announcements. And he wanted the people in America to understand that we needed help and what it was we were fighting for. His radio address as follows. My fellow Americans, last night when I spoke with you about the fall of Rome, I knew at that moment, the troops of the United States and our allies were crossing the channel in another and greater operation. It has come to pass with success thus far. And so in this poignant hour, I ask you to join me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. For the enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces. Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again. And we know that by thy grace and by thy righteousness, our cause, our sons will triumph. They will be sorely tried by night and by day without rest until the victory is won. The darkness will be rent by noise and flame. Men's souls will be shaken with the violence of war. For these men are lately drawn from the ways of peace. They fight not for conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They fight to let justice arise and tolerance and goodwill among all thy people. They yearn but for the end of battle, for they return to the haven of home. Some will never return, embrace these, Father, and receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. 
and for us at home, fathers, mothers, children, sisters, brothers of these brave men overseas whose thoughts and prayers are ever with them, help us. This is the hour of our great sacrifice, the prayer ended. Mr. Roosevelt understood what it was we were fighting for, and he understood the people he had sent to these faraway lands across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, who were going to fight and die for our cause. He knew that many would not return, and he himself received his final honor, which I think he would have appreciated. In the New York Times on the 16th of April, the list of casualties, as was done once a week in those days, was printed. And since that was considered the national newspaper, it didn't matter where you were from, what state, the full list was printed. At the top of the list that morning, the name Franklin Roosevelt appeared because he too was a casualty of war. And he is one of our honored dead as the commander in chief. Well, in closing, please enjoy this day in reverence. Remember always those who gave all that we who remain could enjoy so much. But remember we owe them a sacred duty to serve and protect the dream of America, its values, and each other. We must continue to build that more perfect union. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Armstead. For those of you who can, uh, please stand. At this time, I would like to do what submarine veterans call toll the boats for the month of May. This is how submarine veterans remember those who didn't come home, as well as those who passed before us in what we term eternal patrol. Tolling of the boats for the month of May. USS Squalus, SS 192, 52339. 26 men lost, 33 men rescued. USS Legardo, SS 371, 5445, 85 men lost. USS Stickleback, SS 415, 53058, no loss of life. USS Scorpion II, SSN 589, 527, 68, 99 men lost. One bell for each of our departed shipmates. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, if I could ask both Mayor McConnell and Dr. Armstead to please take the wreath that's over here to our left and place it directly behind in the center of our memorial. have a gentleman that has asked for five minutes and he is one of our oldest veterans here 91 years old and I'm going to give him his five minutes so. yeah. <laughs> thank you very much sir my name is Joe Mickelson I've been around here a long time I'm the person that's responsible for all these plaques in back of us find this myself way back when nobody really cared about the bronze ones that were stolen so I took personal money and bought all these plaques had them engraved we are now in the process of going to add some more names to these plaques and as soon as uh, Nestor Olega gives me the list they'll be put on the on the wall here I'm, I've been working and uh, hello I've been working uh, to uh, 
get this become a national monument here to the federal government. This property here should be all encased and given to the seven veterans organizations of Vallejo because they should own this. In doing that, they become property owners and it is not public land and it won't happen what's happened in the past. We have no right to run people off or anything because it's public land. So we're working on that. I'm over 90 years and I've been around a long time, know the politics, know everything. And I'm gonna say one thing to this wonderful audience here. We'll always win because we sell freedom. You understand? Let's hear a hand for that. <laughs> Communism, is, we're right on them, right on them. I was in Korea from 1950 to 53 and I was a draftee because I did not believe in the Korean War. But naturally, I had to serve my two years, and I was all served on the front line in North Korea. I know many North Koreans. I've been up to the Yellow River. I've seen, all, I've seen people die that shouldn't have died, North Koreans. There's a lot of good North Koreans, farmers and wives and everything. I've seen it, done it, and I just want to let the people know that we're on the right path for love and freedom. No more wars, period. Anybody that heads for wars should be kicked down the road because that's just a waste of life. We can negotiate. Now we had a past president, presidents have, could have declared war seven times. I can give you the details, but we're not getting into a long speech here, okay? Uh, but anyway, I wanna thank everybody here. The crowd is great. There's a lot of power here. And I see, I see a lot of my good friends. And thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you, sir. Putting together any events like this always takes a group of people. And I want to thank all of the volunteers who helped us do everything today. And that includes the gentleman that was previously encamped here. I came here early, spoke to him, and he was kind enough to move all of his things. I also want to personally thank and acknowledge both Nestor Oliga and Bill Dornick, who we could, especially I could not have done this without. I was in the middle of a election campaign for a large nonprofit, so our elected officials can understand. By the way, I did win 76% of the vote. And I was finishing up a year at COVID Command Center, San Francisco, working as a project manor, manager in Hunters Point Bayview with most, the most vulnerable population we have, the people who sleep on the streets, and a few other minor things like life. I am grateful for all of your support and kindness to me. At this time, if everyone who can stand, I would like to have Ron Akistapache play taps and that will be followed by America Beautiful, the Beautiful by Dr. Armistead. spacious skies for amber waves of cream for purple mountains majesties above the fruited plain America America God 
shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Thank you, Dr. Armstead. Greatly appreciate it. This concludes our ceremony. Thank you, everyone.